Our special guest today is a frequent visitor at, to the National Archives, coming with his staff and his family often to experience the National Archives. And having him observed him with his guests really knows his history. Tom Daschle, a graduate of South Dakota State University, served in the Air Force as an intelligence officer for the Strategic Air Command. He represented South Dakota in Congress for 26 years, four terms in the House of Representatives and three terms in the Senate. Elected to the House in 1978, he was part of the Democratic leadership before moving to the Senate for three terms beginning in 1987. He was elected Senate Democratic leader in 1994 and is one of the longest serving Democratic leaders in the Senate and the only one to serve twice as majority leader and twice as minority leader. Since he left the Senate in 2005, Senator Daschle has continued to have a strong voice among Washington policymakers. He's contributed to the debates over health care, climate change, renewable energy, financial services reform, telecommunications, and international trade issues. In 2007, he joined with three other former Senate majority leaders, Howard Baker, George Mitchell, and Bob Dole, to create the Bar Bipartisan Policy Center, which seeks to find common ground on the nation's most pressing issues. These days, he's a senior policy advisor at DLA Piper's Government Affairs Practice and is a member of the DLA Piper's Global Board. Today, Senator Daschle will discuss his new book, The U.S. Senate, Fundamentals of American Government, written with Charles Robbins. In it, he explains in historical detail how the 100-member body works and has worked in the past, something I suspect we all wonder about at this particular time. Tom Daschle. David, thank you very much for that generous introduction, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here today. I, uh, it is a real pleasure for me. Every time I come to the National Archives, I'm, I'm moved, I'm inspired, and uh, for good reason. I think the Archives, is, I'm sure everyone in the room would, would, would uh, agree, is, is a national treasure. And I don't know of another place in this city or maybe anywhere else uh, where the extraordinary opportunities to witness the essence of America is more palpable, more visible, and more apparent. Herein lies the story of our nation, and I am very grateful for the extraordinary leadership that David and his strong team provides and the opportunity to, uh, to visit as we do with such uh, routine and casual uh, approach. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been here, and each and every time it's a memorable experience. David mentioned the co-author, and I really want to emphasize uh, how much of an, enjoyed, an enjoyable experience it was to work with Charles Robbins. He couldn't be here today, but uh, Charles is, uh, is a very gifted uh, and uh, respected writer of many years, and uh, it was just a pleasure. Uh, to work with him. So I salute him and thank him as well. Our book was just released this week, and it is an exciting moment for an author to have his work published and uh, released as it has been again, and uh, so I celebrate that fact this week. It's all about the body of the United States Senate, its history, its current circumstances, and our aspirations for it as an institution. And I hope you'll find it to be of, of, of value for those of you who have the opportunity to read it. I was walking through the quarters of the Senate many years ago with uh, a, a friend from Nebraska. It's a name, he, he holds a name that some of you may, may recognize. His name was Ted Sorensen. Ted was the speechwriter to John Kennedy. And as we were walking through those marble corridors with the wonderful statues casting their shadows. I think he might have been inspired to say to me that while the National Archives is the place where our history is stored, it's the United States Senate where our history is made in ways large and small. Today, history is being made. Tomorrow, history will be made. 
a United States Senator actually makes history at the very first moment they come into the United States Senate and are sworn in. It's a tradition and a long-standing practice that as a senator is sworn in, he's given a number. And that number goes all the way back to the very first senators. The first two elected from Pennsylvania have the distinction of being the senators with the first two numbers, William McClay and Robert Morris, numbers one and number two. We've had 1,945 United States senators in our history. And I have the fortunate distinction of holding a very special number. My number is 1776. <laughs> and so I've always thought very fondly of the extraordinary historical consequence of that number. And what each senator does with that distinction and that number through his or her career for as long as they're there. From the very first moment, you're aware of its powerful linkage, really, to the history going back to our founders, to the heirs and guardians of a miracle of self-governance, an ideal whose freedoms we swear to uphold and must pass on to future generations undiminished. Eight years after I was sworn in, I had another good fortune to be elected the Democratic leader by my colleagues. I was elected by one vote. And so with that precarious beginning, I started my career not only as a United States Senator, but as the Democratic leader in the United States Senate. And I will always remember an experience that I had shortly thereafter. I was invited by a good friend whose name was Dick, Dick Morris to come and spend some time at his home in South Dakota. Dick was a farmer. He lived outside of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And on the appointed evening, a couple weekends after I was elected, as we had a conversation over meat and potatoes and a wonderful farm dinner, I asked Dick what advice he would have for somebody elected now to this lofty position from the state of South Dakota. He paused for a minute, and then he said, well, I guess if, if I had any advice for you, it would be two things. First, never forget where you came from. Always remember who it was that sent you there. And secondly, pointing at his grandchildren on the wall, he said, you know my grandchildren. You've held them. You know them by name. And then he looked at me and he said, give them hope. Give them some hope. I went home. And later that night, I got a call during the middle of the night with the news that Dick Reiners had died. That moment locked in memory for me the best advice I think I'd ever received in public service, to remember where we came from and to give those we represent some hope. All across America, our country was founded on the premise that the voters of Che's chosen neighbors, people like me to represent them in the United States Senate, sent them to Washington with great goals. A senator's challenge is to focus on those goals and not lose sight of them with the daily bustle and battle. That's very difficult in today's political environment. I had two touchstones who helped me, that helped me actually stay grounded as I carried out my lofty responsibilities as the majority leader. The first was to occupy what is called the leader's desk. Alan Furman knows that well. He looked at it every day as our Senate parliamentarian. The leader's desk is a very special 
special place.